tell me about your loved one. Did they ever talk about their funeral? And sometimes they say, oh yeah, they always said, be sure you do this, or be sure you don't do that. The pathologist usually comes up with the final diagnosis and the final answer as to why the patient was sick, why the patient died. If something, uh, something was inappropriate about the death, it provides enough time for that information to come to the attention of authorities. The first thing in my mind was making a final arrangement. We try to motivate people to get something done something that's uncomfortable to do. I've got my red dress already picked out with a bow. Well, I think we're running out of space, you know, to bury people. People don't realize, I think, how many details there are to be taken care of. Anyone that has a child or has property needs a will. It's that simple. Not that we had millions of dollars, but we had a house, a car, and, you know, some money in the bank. There's a lot of bad stories about, the, about not reviewing beneficiaries, not removing somebody from a will. If I can only tell people one thing to be sure of, the key word is beneficiaries. And there's a checklist, and that checklist is designed to make it easier on the, uh, the family or whoever else is going to deal with those issues upon a death. It was not morbid. It made me feel so much better, and my children were ecstatic. Hi, I'm Pamela Martin. Thanks for joining us for this program, When People Die. Oh sure, it can be a depressing topic, and the thought of talking about death with our loved ones makes many of us uncomfortable. But we'll hear personal testimony and gleam information from experts on how to lessen the burden for those left behind. As we'll hear, planning for when people die should be a part of life. So watch this program together. It can help get the talk started. And now, let's be honest. Some of us are planners and others are not. Some folks rely on their blackberries and calendars to get through each day, while others prefer to take life as it comes. Does that attitude translate to death? Deciding how you will die, even pre-planning your funeral, making your wishes known, it's a growing trend. The business of burial is changing here in the Bay State. People are asking for more thrifty funerals and cremation is on the rise. Deciding how your own funeral will go is becoming more common, not just for the elderly or terminally ill. So what happens when we die? Where will our physical body go? Hathaway Funeral Home has handled funeral arrangements for thousands of South Coast residents since 1893. Hathaway remains family run. According to BT Hathaway, many people, young and old, are pre-planning, even pre-paying for their funeral. Sure, it gives people a, a chance to not get bogged down in, in quite so many details. And, and even with a pre-arrangement, there's still plenty of things to to you know to finalize and work out so uh, so like you know it's a big uh, it's a big head start Reverend Don Meir of First Baptist Church in Fall River says families have different attitudes when discussing death when I uh, serve families I always ask them well tell me about your loved one did they ever talk about their funeral and sometimes they say oh yeah they always said be sure you do this or be sure you don't do that and sometimes, you know, nothing was ever said. And I guess each family has its own comfort levels, but I would, I'm always encouraging people, regardless of your comfort, comfort level, just like you plan for retirement. You know, you gotta be sure you have enough savings in the bank. You plan to, you know, plan your budget. Uh, the same is true of planning our own funeral service and you know, what are my wishes. We also got to plan ahead for our, for our final disposition. Because if we don't do it, it's, a, it's truly a disservice to our families. You know, it's, um, if, if no decisions are made, then someone's uh, I make decisions based on their thinking and not on your thinking. Some people go so far as to write their own obituary, even choose flowers and church songs. I think this whole idea 
pre-planning for our funeral services. It's a new phenomenon, but I think a necessary one and a helpful one and a healthy one. Like in anything in life, we make a plan, we work the plan, and we can change the plan, but at least we have something to work with. Otherwise, it's just helter skelter. It just adds needless, needless stress and needless expense uh, if plans aren't made ahead of time. Laws demand prepaid funeral monies be transferred in the event of a move. Medicaid allows burial funds be reserved for those in state care. The most crucial time uh, is when someone is applying for Medicaid because of a because a nursing home uh, transition is pending, uh, because there's an opportunity to set funds aside that are that are excluded from. Um, uh, from uh, the other measurements that go into eligibility, um, and that you know that's the that's the most important reason to get a pre you know to to do a prearrangement. But at any age, when folks are trying to uh, sort through their affairs and thinking about wills and getting things up to date, you know this is a you know this is another part of that. Reverend Meir says funerals are more for the living than the dead. A chance for survivors to begin to grieve and remember their loved one in a unique way. What's important to me when I conduct a service is that we honor the person who died and how, how can we remember, the, remember them. Um, and I you know, always encourage family members to either write something that I can read or say something themselves. And of course that is uh, foreign to some people, you know, oh I couldn't do that. And I understand. I, I, it's a time to be gentle with people and not force, you know, different uh, ways of doing things. But I always encourage expression. Some families I know before the service and some I'm just meeting for the first time. You know, they don't, they, perhaps they don't have a church. And I always go to meet with them and talk with them because I need to glean the necessary um, information to make the service personal. And these gatherings are about telling stories. And, and the reality is, in, uh, in all of our lives, uh, there are fewer and fewer opportunities for people to get together on the front porch and to talk about Aunt Sally or you know or, or Uncle Joe or whoever you know whoever those people are and pass along those stories this you know this is one of those last opportunities to get that done and so you know what we certainly encourage people to do is to bring you know bring photographs and other personal memorabilia <laughs> State laws vary. In Massachusetts, funeral homes must remain separate from traditional funeral businesses such as flowers or monuments. We're only licensed to operate as funeral homes, funeral directors. Uh, we're not allowed to own or operate a crematory, for instance, or be involved in, in the operations of a cemetery. Uh, uh, neither monuments nor, uh, uh, nor flowers, anything that's a direct ancillary business of, of funeral service. So that's it's a little unique. Funeral homes, like real estate offices, should keep cash deposits out of the operating budget. B.T. Hathaway says obviously consumers should ask questions and keep documentation. Shop around. There are more than 700 licensed funeral homes just in our state. You know, those monies are to go into a, a formal funeral trust or they're to go into an, uh, to a funeral insurance product. And so there should, be a, there should be a very complete and very thorough paper trail. Reverend Meir assists his congregation in funeral planning. It's his job as church leader. Meir makes available The Five Wishes, a booklet that opens the door of communication. Take this home. Work it with your spouse. Uh, work at it with, with your parents. So just to at least from this end, and how it works out in families. So you have this tool in your hand, and five wishes is, you know, how do you wish to be treated at your time of death? You know, the healthcare proxy. You know, how do you wish uh, your funeral service to look? The casket showroom at Hathaway has dozens of styles, starting with simple pine boxes. For those wishing to be cremated, there are just as many urns. Reverend Meir calls it a personal choice. Some people, uh, like the idea of a, of a marker someplace. I, you know, even though if, if my body's not there, just a marker. And some people say, just take me out to the woods, or I've, done, I've gone to the woods, I've gone to the ocean. And just, again, as a personal preference, more people seem to like to have a place. Although there are those exceptions, just take me out in the backyard, you know, I mean, you know, in the woods. You know, take me out and scatter ashes there, and um, 
of course, I heard my father says he wants his ashes scattered over Yankee Stadium. I don't think it's legal. Of course, cremation is is a growing choice, um, and that becomes, you know, for us one of the biggest areas of discussion with folks is. Um, and, and when it comes to prearrangements, it's, it's one of the areas that takes the most time is, okay, we're, we're talking about cremation, but what's going to go along with that? Uh, cremation can be many things. It can be, um, you know, it can be a very simple process of us, uh, of us uh, taking care of the paperwork and seeing to it that a cremation occurs and then returning the cremated remains to the family and, and basically there be no services. On the, other, uh, on the other end, we gather in all of the traditional ways, uh, have, a, you know, have visiting hours, have a funeral service at church. An urn arrangement such as this allows several pallbearers to carry the cremated remains, if a family wishes. This custom-made urn holder is later a birdhouse. Once ashes are scattered, it's handmade locally and can be ordered online. Cremation laws order a 48-hour waiting period. B.T. Hathaway calls that an important safeguard. If something was inappropriate about the death, it provides enough time for that information to come to the attention of authorities. Okay, if so, because once cremation occurs, there's there's no evidence. So if you know if some you know it it allows enough time for suspicions of you know foul play or whatnot to come to the surface and, uh, you know, and the, uh, the authorities to react to that. Cremation is not, is not an overnight sort of a thing. Depending on where the weekends fall and, and the activities of the crematory itself, it, can, it, it will take several days before uh, the cremation is finished and, and the, rem, you know, the cremated remains come back to us. Many areas of the country are experiencing a shortage of cemetery space, and it's no surprise why. Building a new cemetery is kind of like building a landfill. There's a mountain of paperwork and permitting required. That's why many people with an eye toward the environment now opt for cremation. You can obviously fit many small urns in the same spot that would be taken up by just one casket. Cremation could be an economic issue. Uh, I think we're running out of space, you know, to bury people. I think that the, the uh, cost of funeral services and uh, just unfortunately, you know, the way cost of gasoline, cost of overhead, just cost of salary, everything just goes up. So it could be economics is why interest in, um, more interest in cremation or availability, openness to it. Because historically, cremation has always been an option. Still ahead, another reason to pre-plan, ensuring your assets end up where you want them to. A financial planner helps this retired couple cross their T's and dot their eyes. Archaeologists have found evidence that Neanderthal man, 60,000 years ago, held primitive funerals in practiced burial rituals. This program is made possible with support from MenuJoy.com. We show menus from your favorite local restaurants. Married 52 years, Virginia and Jim Mullins of Somerset admit she is the planner. Their marriage has been a partnership, with room for differences of opinion and individuality. She enjoys traveling, while Jim wants to remain at home. I'm more or less a home, but when I was 17 years old, I went halfway around the world in a sailor suit. That's all the traveling I want to do. Upon retirement, Mrs. Mullins insisted they put their ducks in order. I wasn't interested in it, really. The first thing in my mind was making uh, final arrangements. And finally, uh, after o over the years, you see your, your compatriots all pass away. You realize something's going to be done. And we ultimately, she talked me into it. And uh, uh, we did our final arrangements. There was nothing, really nothing to it. Years ago, we went to um, a lawyer and we did a trust. And we did the Homestead Act, and we did all that. And everything's got to be written down, you know, that I want this one to get this necklace. Mrs. Mullins also called in Joe Marshall of JM Associates in Fall River for assistance in financial planning. We try to motivate people to get something done, something that's uncomfortable to do, to talk about, well, what happens if? I become disabled, I become sick, 
um, I pass away. Some cases, many people would put their heads in the sand. Yeah. And they'll say, I'm not going to deal with this, uh, or I don't need to deal with this today. Well, procrastination is the worst thing. The Mullins have three children, several grandchildren. Upon their passing, they want to be sure assets are fairly divided. I never had to worry about money. I had a steady job. I worked in the power industry for 40 years, so I always knew I had another, another uh, check coming. Uh, Ginny did all the planning. She did all the monetary planning and the investments, what little we could do. What we realized, there was a lot more to it than what we could handle, so that's where we got involved with Joe. The, uh, as far as the investments, uh, we leave everything to him. If he knows what, what has to be done. He knows what we're looking for. We're not looking to make a great uh, short-term investment and make a lot of money. Not that we had millions of dollars, but we had a house, a car, and you know, some money in the bank. And um, I figured we needed something because my husband and I know nothing about stocks and bonds. And I just wanted somebody to tell us what we should do. And it's worked out beautifully. And then a friend of mine's mother paid for her funeral. And I thought that was a good idea. I have a, a daughter in Fort Wayne. I have a daughter in Wisconsin. And I just have my son here. And I thought it would be a very good idea. So we did that. Now that their estate is finalized, Mr. Mullins is grateful his wife pushed the issue. He says too many people become bogged down in day-to-day -day affairs and overlook planning for later years. You're so busy wrapped up in the day-to-day -day life that you don't think about until it actually hits you. Then you, you walk out one day and you say, I don't have to go to work anymore, now what? Anyone that has a child or has property needs a will. It's that simple. Anybody that has that. Joe Marshall insists his clients get down to the nitty-gritty and analyze a lifetime of accumulations. Well, sure, there's property, investments, and savings accounts, but what about jewelry, cars, boats, artwork, and antiques? Who gets what and how much? We have a form we ask them to complete. It's called a document locator form, and what's listed on that, it's about five pages, everything you've never thought about. You know, where's a copy of my will? Where is uh, the extra set of car keys? Where's my DD-214 when I was in the service? And there's a checklist, and that checklist is designed to make it easier on the, uh, the family or whoever else is going to deal with those issues upon a death or a disability or, or, or something along those lines. So we always do that, that locator form. Our job is to create peace of mind, and that will do that, and we tell them. We'll tell them, Take your alpha child or the child that's going to be responsible for seeing these things through, give them a copy of this. Or tell somebody where the copy is. And remember the five wishes booklet? That too should be included. What does life support mean to the individual? How long? What type? Do not resuscitate? What do you consider the end stage of death? So our job is not an easy job, I mean, uh, but it's very fulfilling because after it gets done, those type of things get done, uh, we feel like we've accomplished something. And there's peace of mind associated with getting those things done. It's just that, that period of time from I don't have to do anything to now I'm educated, now I have to do something, now I'm uncomfortable, I need help doing it, that's where we come in. We'll motivate those people to actually get those things done. Still ahead, the Mullins take financial planning one step further and purchase side-by-side -side burial plots. This program is brought to you by MenuJoy.com. We show menus, you browse, you decide. There was another reason for the Mullins to pre-plan. With two daughters out of state, the Mullins want to avoid burdening their son with all decisions regarding burial and division of assets. My son knows where all our papers are, and uh, we discussed it, and it's just a nice feeling that all that is done. What did your children say? You mentioned to me before that they were grateful. Tell oh, yeah. Oh, yes. Why? Why? Well, because it, it, I didn't think it was fair to my son being the only one here. And it is such a, a sad time when you lose a parent. 
The Mullins purchased two plots at St. Patrick's in Fall River. And guess what? Jim plans to party in heaven. When I got to the plot, I looked and within 15 feet of one of my old drinking buddies was there, and 10 feet from here was another one, so the three of us in one group, we're going to have a fine time up there. Mr. Mullins is a natural musician. He's self-taught. He hopes the afterlife includes other band members and his piano. Mrs. Mullins says planning her own funeral resulted in peace of mind. Like most of her life decisions, she handled it matter-of-factly and says the process wasn't frightening or depressing. It was not morbid. It made me feel so much better and my children were ecstatic. You know, that we had finally done that. Mrs. Mullins was assisted in her planning with this book, Creating Meaningful Funeral Ceremonies. From the funeral parlor, they gave us a book that we fill out, which we haven't completely finished yet, but you know, like things like you say, a closed casket. Uh, another, I've got my red dress already picked out with a bow. I've even cut pictures out. I like when I go to uh, a wake to have the pictures like, you know, what do they call it? A memory board. Yeah, a memory board. And I've already got pictures in a box. And I told my daughter where they are. You know, things like that, people don't realize, I think, how many details there are to be taken care of. Joe Marshall reminds clients to keep abreast of changing laws. You've got certain legal documents in place, well, things change. One of your beneficiaries or one of your heirs has passed away, they're still in the will. They're entitled to, their heirs are entitled to something if it's not written properly, okay? It exists. So. Being prepared is not being prepared today, putting it in the drawer and never thinking about it again. One of the things that uh, we advocate for and we do is at least on an annual basis we get together because we're not usually the first person a person calls when they have a new grandchild or uh, their son gets divorced. I mean, there's a lot of different things that happen in a life, a job change, uh, winning the lottery. We're just not the first ones that, that people call. So in our particular case, we, we call a client in at least every year, and sometimes it takes 10 minutes, sometimes it takes an hour. But we have to deal with any changes that need to be made. The other th key word is uh, the, about beneficiaries. We've, I found out that people like to leave money to an estate, and that's the worst thing you can possibly do. If it's got a beneficiary, they get the money. A beneficiary over here, he gets the money. It goes to the estate, the federal government takes a slice, and the mm -hmm. state takes a slice, and it's a big slice. Yep. So if I, only get, if I can only tell people one thing to be sure of, it, the key word, is, as Joe mentioned, is beneficiaries. Joe Marshall often receives calls from people describing themselves as former spouses, stepchildren, or half-siblings. They're worried about being cheated or forgotten. Well, depending on what a will says, it may be too late for those people. But Marshall prides himself on eliminating that sort of hardship for his regular customers. One of the first things we do when we sit down is to check beneficiary designations. And we'll ask, is this really what you want? Oh, no, I, that's, my brother's deceased. You become really, really involved in a client's life. Um, there's a lot of bad stories about, the, about not reviewing beneficiaries, uh, not removing somebody from a will. Somebody thinks that they make a will and they don't have to deal with it anymore. Uh, we had someone attend one of our seminars that said, uh, I, I appreciate all the time you spent with us, but I have a will. And I'm saying to myself, then you missed the other 45 minutes that we talked about because that becomes only a small part of it. There's other issues, and if a will satisfies your situation, you're really, really lucky. You've got a very simple situation. Marshall's advice is always the same. Make sure it's all in writing and signed. You can have a durable power of attorney, which allows someone to act as your agent if you're unable to to act as your own agent. But a healthcare proxy, the hospitals now require that when you go in for any type of surgery. Well, you should do one uh, separate and apart from the hospitals because the hospitals is designed to protect the hospital. You should do actually your own, whereas uh, in my particular case, I'll name my wife as the agent and then my oldest child as the second agent. But it's very clear 
that no one is supposed to go against my wishes. So that's why you have to have it in writing, because the doctors will not act, the nurses will not act unless they see something in writing. They'll, everybody can argue all they want, but the legal document says this is what you have to do. Still ahead, members of a hospital staff deal with death daily. They are experienced professionals that make dying less scary for the rest of us. Egypt is credited as the land where embalming the dead originated. Dr. David Ziamba defines death as loss of heartbeat. Dr. Ziamba has a 20-year career at St. Luke's in New Bedford and is president of the medical staff. I chose to be a pathologist because uh, the pathologist usually comes up with the final diagnosis and the final answer as to why the patient was sick, why the patient died. Uh, and, uh, you know, early on in your training, as with a surgeon, as with anyone, you know, uh, performing procedures, there's a certain amount of stealing yourself to, uh, to uh, the process, but we tend to be very focused as pathologists on the science of medicine. Ziemba recognizes each death as a loss. As a person, he's respectful and kind. But as a scientist, he looks for answers. Answers only his autopsy can provide. It's a scientific uh, event for us to try to, you know, uh, uncover disease, to detect disease, and to report it in a way that's useful to uh, the family, useful to the physician, and useful also in many ways, uh, you know, to the department of public health in terms of uh, statistics, for instance, you know, and it hasn't happened here, but I could say, you know, if, if a large number of people are dying from an environmental cause in one particular area, then the autopsy would be very important, important to the public health. Dr. Ziemba's autopsy can uncover hidden disease. For the family, an autopsy answers questions and may provide peace of mind. If a family feels to some extent that they could have done something that the, the final result of the autopsy proves that, that would have made no difference, it would have been immaterial, then they feel that burden of guilt lifted from them. So in that sense, it's very helpful to the family. State law demands only a specially licensed person may transport a body. And that's where the funeral home and a hearse comes in, whether to a person's home, accident scene, or in this case, the hospital. The less complicated uh, track, the avenue to go down to, would be not having an autopsy or a post-mortem examination. In that case, the funeral home would uh, be chosen by the family. The funeral home would arrive at admitting, the admitting department in the hospital, would sign in, identify themselves, then a security officer would accompany them to the morgue, and the, uh, the loved one would be transported to the uh, funeral home's hearse, which is on the side door of the hospital, not through the front door of the hospital, in a very, again, well-organized, uh, respectful, and secure process. Dr. Ziemba is a professional. Death is commonplace at his work, but because the loss is so final, he understands the heartbreak and heartache for those left behind. Among pathologists, as with anyone in the general population, you'll find that they approach it in many different ways and depends on the individual. But, uh, you know, I, I think it's a very important, although difficult, uh, part of, of a person's life to plan what happens at the very end and what happens, you know, what they would like to happen after they've passed away. And it's, uh, you know, it's difficult to confront, but are pathologists any better at doing it? Absolutely not. Hospitals will keep a person alive as long as scientifically possible. But life and death should be your decision, shouldn't it? 
Healthcare proxies deciding end-of-life medical treatment have become popular with baby boomers, but these important legal documents should be considered by everyone, regardless of age or health. And it also takes a burden off the family because, you know, uh, grandpa said this is the way he wants it done, this is what he wants done after death, whatever kind of ceremony, if he wants a ceremony, so it it's, uh, relieves a burden from the family. So beyond my medical uh, scientific role, I would suggest it. Oftentimes there are many members of a family who come together at a difficult time and say, you know, I spoke to Aunt Sally, I spoke to my mother, this is what I believe they would want. The healthcare proxy should have that conversation with who they choose so that you do have an understanding of what that person wants. Now that doesn't mean that you go through every scenario, but you know, you go through the important things that you would want should you not be able to speak for yourself. Barbara Livingston assists patients and families in making heart-wrenching choices. The doctor's job is to keep people alive, in some cases using extreme measures. But many family members want to refuse that option. Written documents alleviate some pain when making life and death choices. Write it down. I think the best thing to always say, again, if it's an uncomfortable conversation, and I think that um, in this area it is a very large cultural issue that we run into. It's not something you want to talk about. That's fine. Get a notebook, write it down, just tell people it's in my box. You know, it's in my special file, it's in my bureau drawer. But if you can be detailed, write it down. And absolutely there are things that you need to do before you, and the official word we call it here is lack capacity. If you come into the hospital and then you want a decision made and you are not able to respond to us so that, for example, to do a healthcare proxy, I would say, do you know who John is? Is John your nephew? Yes. Do you trust John to make decisions for you? Yes. That's as simple as it is for healthcare proxy. But if it gets into question that you can't make informed decisions, you can't do a healthcare proxy. That means you can't do a power of attorney. That means you can't do a will. So you've missed all these opportunities to prepare. And again, you've put that on your family to have to work some of that out. Barbara has a number of legal documents at her fingertips, thanks to the wonder of the web. She'll work with as many family members as necessary. It's that word again, communication. If you want to do something supportive and caring for your family, you want to take the responsibility to say, whether it be written, whether it be verbal, preferably written, um, what it is that you want done, anywhere from a health care proxy to where you want your possessions to be, to where you um, want your final resting place to be. These are the tools that you give to a family so that they don't have to come together against one another to make those decisions. If you have a lawyer and they have copies of all your information, that's just a wonderful thing. But if nobody knows who your lawyer is or where you have that, that's not helpful. If you have um, a safety deposit box, you always need to have an extra key with somebody because what if, God forbid, you're in a fire in your own home and that key is lost. Barbara is a walking resource. Many families have taken advantage of her expertise and experience. Hers is a service the hospital provides free of charge. We live in a seaport. A big option here is that there are rules that govern um, should you want to be taken to sea, but that's one of the number one requests that we get here, is that we have fishermen and they want to go to the place that they thrived in their life. They don't want to be buried in land. That would be foreign to them. They want to be buried at sea, so we help families with that as well. Don't be afraid. Ask questions. There's always people to ask. We deal with it every day, so if it's an uncomfortable discussion to have, you know, um, pick up the phone and someone will sit with you. You know, I think the, the more you ask, the more prepared you are, the better you'd be. And I think the other thing, very important, you're never too young. 200 years ago, dying was more hands-on. But when did that change? Ahead, the professionals explore changes in deaf attitudes. This program is made possible with support from MenuJoy.com. We show menus from your favorite local restaurants. Reverend Meir says dying has become so expensive because it's become so scary. That wasn't the case when families handled the task themselves. From washing and simple embalming practices to dressing the body and finally burial. Death was more natural. I think people that we're in an agrarian society, you know, we all lived on farms, more so than we lived in the cities, and therefore um, that's what you did. You just, people came to the home and there was, a, there was Uncle Harry there laid out in the home and 
uh, embalming was necessary, <laughs> you know, uh, for cleanliness reasons, sanitation reasons, and um, it was and then you had the service, and you just bury them in the family plot. But now, you know, we become more industrialized, uh, more urban. And we have specialists who do things for us. Mir once attended a home wake that eliminated many funeral home services. The family cleaned and displayed the body themselves at home, which is legal in a number of states. And I've been the one here in Fall River, uh, yes. Um, and I was very moved by that. According to Barbara, assigning tasks is a wonderful way to start the grieving process and bring families closer together following a loss. Every family member can do something, down from making lasagna to paying all the bills, whatever it is, it's assigning tasks. And you'd be amazed how families really respond to that because then they know what their role is. I mean, I equate it a lot to a wedding. My usher knows where they have to walk. My, my priest or pastor knows what his role is. The mother of the bride is going to be here. People like that sense of routine. Not everything is fixable, and nor should it be. I mean, death is a part of life. You, you know, There's a natural transition for everyone. I just don't think we talk about that as much. And I think that when you work with services like hospice services or palliative services, those are wonderful for families. Because the focus is really on, it's about accepting it, it's a part of being, it's not a bad thing, it's an okay thing. Still ahead, looking to save money on a funeral? There are many ways to cut costs and still honor the deceased. If you see an adult suddenly collapse, it's important to act fast. Just use hands-only CPR. The first step is to send someone to call 911 or call 911 yourself. Then get directly over the victim. Put the heel of one hand in the center of the chest. Then put your other hand on top of the first. Then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. It's important to push at a rate of 100 beats per minute, which is approximately this tempo. Let's hope you never have to use hands-only CPR. But if you see an adult suddenly collapse, don't be afraid to try it. All you need to remember is to call 911, then push hard and fast in the center of the chest until help arrives. Your actions can help save a life. Hands-only CPR should only be used when you see an adult who has suddenly collapsed and is unresponsive. To learn more, call 877-AHA-4CPR or visit handsonlycpr.org today. Like a wedding or bar mitzvah, there are plenty of ways to save money on a funeral. A number of solutions can be found right at your home computer. Increasingly, many people forego flowers in favor of a charitable donation. Remember the Mullins? They are considering a request that memorial donations be made to hospice or a similar group. Preserving the body or embalming is often an unnecessary expense opt for a closed casket. It's very difficult, for instance, for us to, to guarantee how someone will appear uh, even a day or two after their death, uh, depending on sorts of medications that they've been on, the, the sorts of illnesses that they may, uh, that they may have uh, suffered from. Um, their appearance can change very rapidly sometimes. A simple church gathering just before the service eliminates costly calling hours at the funeral home. We've had uh, calling hours right here in church. In fact, if something happens to me uh, next several years and I'm still active in ministry, I, that's where I want my calling hours, right here at church. This is where I live and breathe and have my being. Granite markers may be purchased locally or online, and prices start at just a few hundred dollars. The cremated remains are then buried under a tree or placed near a memory bench and honored with that marker. Now, for those being buried, choose their favorite comfortable clothing, a uniform, or their best suit. There's no need to purchase that expensive attire sold at a funeral home. Ask around. Find out what others have done. You'll learn that there's no average price for a funeral. Online shopping can save family thousands of dollars. Caskets there start at $900 and can be delivered the next day. Hathaway Funeral Home prices some coffins up to $20,000. But like most big ticket items, casket choice reflects personal choice. Veterans and their spouses may be buried free at any national cemetery. 
Hospital counselors like Barbara Livingston are available to guide you, free of charge. There's no reason to have to pay to do a health care proxy. It's a readily available form. Um, here at South Coast, we have it online. We have it in primary languages, um, Portuguese, Spanish. Um, we even have it in Khmer. Um, we encourage people to use them in the multiple languages because, again, you want the person to understand clearly, repeat back what it is they're signing. Um, you can get the five wishes online. Uh, that is something that I believe is a small cost, but you mail away for it. Five wishes is a little different, and it's a more um, expansive form that asks more detailed questions. You can do a power of attorney, again, something that often people think is a legal document you can't do on your own. You can buy one in a stationery store. You just need to get it notarized. There's a wonderful thing called the Massachusetts Cremation Society that's online, and there are other societies as well. But you can prepay for a cremation even down to the cards that you want given out. What is a good death? Reverend Meir says one thing he always prays for is a painless death. If there's a good way to die, that's what we all want. Oh, I've seen uh, many older folks just die with a smile on their face, so glad that their last breath is taken. Uh, whether they're struggling with emphysema, or struggling with cancer, or just struggling with old age. Is it easier to see a person linger, or is it just easier to, to see someone die in a car crash suddenly? I, I oh, good easy. question. What's easier for folks? That's People a, say that, oh, they lived a long life. We knew it was coming. Yeah. That's a very good question. Death, whatever size it comes in, always brings sadness to it. The only time it doesn't is when it's a relief. Someone's been suffering, and you know they wanted to let go. But even then, it's sad because their life is over. Um, a sudden death is always easier on the person who dies, but it's harder on the family. Uh, I guess the ideal deaths come in older age, when there was some expectation, and comes peacefully in the night, right? When someone falls asleep. I know I pray with many of my people, I'll pray that God will take you some night when you're sleeping. Barbara Livingston counsels families on letting loss take on a positive spin. I think that we as a society often approach death um, as a thing that we remove ourselves from, that we don't want to discuss. It's an uncomfortable thing. It's something that you keep under the shadows. It will happen to all of us. Truly a good way to look at death a positive way to look at death is as we look at birth. We prepare for birth. We put things aside. We nest. Um, there's even a celebration. And I think that culturally, when you look um, back historically, there are cultures that celebrate. Um, it is a sad time, but it also can be a very spiritual time. It can be a very giving time to see families come together, to hold someone's hand for the last time. Um, there's nothing more powerful than helping someone ease you know, to their higher power, to let them know that they've been loved and cared for. Um, it can be a warm experience. It doesn't have to be a sad, frightening experience. So in that, we really counsel families that if you prepare financially, medically, organize your family, that time then can be spent doing the hand-holding versus the errands and the tasks that we often then have to ask families to do in order to prepare. Regardless of what funeral route a family takes, life has ended. Lives are changed. An expensive funeral cannot buy healing or happiness for those left behind. Some people are very thankful when we remember their um, loved ones, you know, maybe three weeks later, four months later, a year later. How are you doing? Because people don't want to ask. You know, sometimes people are afraid to open up a wound, but in actuality, that's what the griever wants more than anything, to talk about their grief. And it's just a matter of just being with that person. And, giving them time and space to do that. And that's what mourning and grieving is. Mm -hmm. And the funeral is just a part of it, not the end of it. That person will always be part of our lives and always be part of our memories, and it's not over with. Their life is over on this earth, but there's always a hole in our heart. and you know, so It needs to be dealt with, and the more we talk about it, the more we grieve with others, the more time we spend, I think the healthier we all are. Death comes with life. Being prepared can help us enjoy the time we do have left. The average lifespan is just 29,000 days. Make each one count. For more information, speak with your clergy or contact the professionals that are experts in this field. Thanks for watching this program, When People Die. I'm Pamela Martin.